What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hook Shots Podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli, and I am particularly excited about today's episode. This is going to be so much fun. Now, granted, this is going to speak mostly to all of the fly tires out there, and I know that there are a lot of you, okay? But I think that if you just fly fish, whether you tie or not, or maybe you're just fly curious, okay, you can kind of consider today's podcast uh, in a roundabout way, like an episode of how it's made. Okay. You ever watch that show? Like it's a Sunday in the middle of the winter and you're just in your underwear and there's nothing whatsoever on TV and you, you, you put on how it's made. And at first you're like, ah, what, what is the, what, 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 why am I watching this? And then 45 minutes later, you realize that you have been fully entrenched in the manufacturing process of a toilet brush. You know what I mean? Your wife's like, come on, we got to get going. And it's like, we're not going anywhere until I see the full culmination of a put together weed whacker, honey. Okay. This is going to kind of be like that. And I find what we're going to be talking about today fascinating. And that is essentially how a fly gets into the major leagues. And by that, I mean sold through an Orvis or an umqua, and available widely in fly shops all over the place, which for many fly tires is the ultimate dream, to have some pattern that you have created prove itself so much that one of the major league teams says, we want that, okay, we're going to give you some money for that, and we are now going to mass produce it and feature it in our catalog. Now, whether you tie flies or not, okay, every, everybody listening to this has been in a fly shop or, a, you know, a tackle shop, big box or otherwise, that has bins of flies, you know, the long bins just full of all the little cool buggy things. And here's what I think is neat about flies, okay? If you look at, at lures in a store from your major players, your Strike Kings, your Rapalas, things like that, you know, a lot of times those those companies have in-house designers that are taxed with coming out with the the greatest new lure for the coming year or tweaks to existing lures. And a lot of times they lean on, say, their bass pros to achieve that, okay? And we're talking about the big companies here, not small-time lure builders. But to me, I don't know, that's, that's not that sexy, really. It's kind of like your office job to develop a new rattle bait or whatever it may be. However, when you look at a bin of flies... Okay, at some point in history, every single one of those was first tied by one person. Okay, now in many cases, you know, some of those flies, you know, wet flies and dry flies, they might have been tied 200 years ago. Okay, they've essentially, I don't know, kind of become like public domain. All right. But with newer patterns and with, with most patterns, like within our lifetime, some tire came up with that, all right? And now it is just, you know, taken hold and it's become a staple in fly boxes for trout or saltwater or bass or whatever it may be, which in my opinion, you know, it makes a fly very personal and it makes it that much cooler to see a commercial tie knowing that that is one guy's hard work and testing that went into putting it in front of you and thereby you buying it and putting it in your box and catching fish somewhere else. And I can happily say that I have lived that dream, okay? I have a pattern in the Orvis catalog. It's been there for a few years now. Now, if you follow us on Facebook, you know all about the Master Splinter, which is mine, which is a mouse tie, okay? It comes up often in, in social media conversations, but the funny thing about that fly is that never in my wildest dreams did I ever expect to nor have intentions of tying something that became a commercial pattern, and that's the truth, because I'll be completely honest with you, okay? I am an okay fly tire, all right, uh, and what I mostly tie are big things. I'm pretty good at tying saltwater flies. I'm pretty good at tying bass flies. I'm pretty good at tying trout streamers, all right? But am I a well-rounded tire? Not even slightly. 
You know what I mean? Like if somebody came up to me and said, I need you to tie me a perfect parachute Adams or we're going to shoot your dog. I'd be like, sorry, scribbles. It's, it's been real. Apologies. Can't do it. I can't do it. I, I, I am not skilled whatsoever in the intricacies of dries and nymphs. Okay. I like big, big hooks, eyes, long fibers. Okay. Now, uh, a bunch of you are probably already familiar with the Master Splinter Mouse, okay? There's been, you know, tons of videos, tons of pictures that I shot a tying tutorial years ago, right after I first made the thing that's, that's gone pretty far and wide, okay? I have never actually publicly told the full story of how the Master Splinter came to be an Orvis pattern, and I think it's an important one to tell given the theme and topic of this podcast, all right? This is going back four or five years ago to the very first time I ever tried mousing at night on the Upper Delaware River system with my good friend and veteran guide, Joe D. Mulderis. We were up there shooting an episode of Hook Shots. We talked about mousing for years, but never actually pulled the trigger to try it. So we went for it. And considering I'd never done it before, I just took whatever mice I could scrounge together that I kind of had, you know, laying around in the garage. And, you know, most of these patterns were bulky, spun hair, you know, much more traditional largemouth patterns than they were trout patterns to the point where I'm, you know, cutting off weed guards and things like that. And the very first night that we fished, we had a whole bunch of blow-ups and slurps on those flies. And we connected with very few fish, right? So I got to thinking about it, and I'm like, man, you know, they're hitting these hair bugs and these, you know, flies with big reverse kind of sneaky peat popper heads, but they are just not getting the hook. And it dawned on me that unless you've got some, you know, 25-inch Goliath brown with a big mouth that's just going to come up and suck that thing down like it's a troiko, all right? Uh, The mouth of an average trout, you know, say 15 to 20 inches, maybe give or take, is really not that big. So they, they really have to be committed to eating that in order to get the hook. So the next day, I'm sitting in a motel room, and I'm thinking about this, and I had some meager, very meager fly tying supplies with me, and I just thought to myself, tonight... I just want to try something slim. I want to try something with no mass. And I just tinkered and in 10 minutes tied what would become the Master Splinter, okay? Which is basically just a riff on the Gurgler, okay? It's got cross-cut bunny hair as a body. So that gets really wet. And and it's it's really just a, a, from underneath, it looks like a wiggly little mouse, or frog, but it just, it has no mass. It rides really low in the water. So there's not that much for a trout to get its mouth around. And guess what happened? We landed a hell of a lot more fish that second and third night using that fly than we did on the stuff we had brought up. It it worked. It was a simple fly. You could throw it on a five weight. Okay, you didn't need to huck it out there on some eight weight to turn it over. And it worked, and it worked so well that it was actually my buddy Jim Fee, who's been on this podcast and was out with us that night, that was like, dude, you got to name this thing. He's like, you should call it the Master Splinter. And I'm a firm believer in, like, once it's said, it has to stick. So it was actually Jimmy that named the thing the Master Splinter. And we had a great time, and I never really thought anything of it. I left a few up there for uh, Joe D to fish, and I put the video on, on YouTube of how to tie one, And over the next couple months, just started getting pictures of some fish with Master Splinters in their mouths. And people were praising it for ease of tying. And, you know, Joe was taking some clients out mousing after that video dropped. And that's all he was using. And they were catching fish. And little by little, there was this very micro, you know, Catskills of New York-centric buzz about that fly. And it was Joe D. who called me up and said, hey, man you need to submit this to Orvis. And at the time I was thinking like, oh, okay. I mean, I don't don't know anything about the process. I don't know anything about that. Never had given it a thought in my life. However, okay, and here's where the the truth and reality comes into this. I happen to be pretty friendly with Sean Brillen, 
who at the time was the guy at Orvis that picked all the new patterns for the coming year's catalog. Okay? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pull punches about that or lie about it. I freaking I knew a guy. So the guy's gonna take my call right out of the gate. And Sean had been seeing the pictures on Facebook and he had watched the episode. And it doesn't hurt when uh, you know, Joe D, who has been Orvis's guide of the year a few times, gives it a glowing recommendation. So I hit up Sean. I said, hey, did you want to see these things? And he said, yeah, send them up. And within a couple of weeks, Sean called me up and he's like, dude, I love it. Like, it's in. It's in the catalog the next year. And I was, I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is uh, a dream come true, though it was a dream that I never really knew that I had kind of deal. Now, let's, let's set the record straight right now. Um, though we'll talk about this more down the road, getting a fly into the majors like you ain't buying a new hell's base skiff with that okay um there's there's this is this is not a money making venture like you know and I, I the serious tires who have patterns out there know this it's a pride thing okay it's a feather in your cap thing you know um unless maybe you're like john barr who invented the copper john nymph which is in pretty much every fly shop on the planet earth everywhere has copper johns i don't know he might be making some serious dough right like he's probably sipping a mojito putting the finishing touches on a on a giant trevally fly on his yacht the copper panty dropper anchored over the great barrier reef i don't know but that's that's a possibility okay um he's probably making a lot more money than timmy muddler who invented the muddler minnow in 1986 right and I said this would be educational. You had no idea that the guy who invented the Muddler Minnow's name was Timmy Muddler. And subsequently, the guy who invented the Zonker was Marty Zonkerini. All right? Google that shit. Google it. You're not doing anything at work today anyway, right? Anyway, who are we talking to today? Well, we are talking to my dear friend, Mr. Brian Schmidt, who for 10 years was the guy at Umqua that decided the fate of every single fly that was submitted by tires the world over looking to get themselves into the majors. If it was going to end up in that catalog, first and foremost, it had to pass through Brian. Now, I know other guys at other fly companies um, that, that had this same role, but what really sets Brian apart, what made him so great at what he did was, you know, he was a really tremendous fly designer in his own right, okay? I mean, if you fly fish for bass or pike, you know, warm water stuff, and you have never thrown a Schmitter bug, okay, get on that. Because what Brian basically designed was a fly version of the jitterbug, and it moves in the water and gurgles just like a jitterbug. Now, the interesting thing about Brian is, is you know, he was such a big name in the fly world for so long. But the reality is that he would go home at night and he'd tinker away with swim baits and hard baits. And actually, when he left Umqua a few years ago, he is now making a go at just Brian Schmidt baits. He makes some incredible waking rats that I've actually written about in Field and Stream. I mean, he he is like a visionary when it comes to that stuff. So he sort of appreciated what went into artificial lure fly design from all angles. And I, and I really don't know anybody better to speak to the process of getting your fly into the majors, especially hearing it from the perspective of the guy working for the company. Surprise, surprise. A lot of this comes down to Money, you know, you might have tied something that 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 just bails fish where you live, and you're like, "Oh my God, this is the hottest shit ever." Uh, but when you hear Brian talk about what goes into this and the behind the scenes, um, you bailing fish at home doesn't necessarily mean a damn thing in the overall scheme of of how a fly is selected to step up to the plate in the big boy stadium and get out there and seen by the world. You know, if you've got a game changer in your fly box right now, or like a uh, lunch money shad perhaps, while Brian may not be the one that designed those flies, 
it's him that you can thank for being able to pick them up in the bin at your local fly shop. Good morning. Brian Schmidt, what's going on, dude? Oh, man. A lot, man. How are you? I'm good. We have not talked in a while. What's a lot? You got me all excited already. Oh, just, uh, you know, we moved from Colorado to uh, Nashville, so we're... uh we're still running around like idiots, Why? You know, trying to find <laughs> find a place to live and all that good stuff. Why did you move? Did you catch all the trophy largemouth in Colorado on your hard baits, and now you got to go pillage some other state? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that was it. You know. Um, yeah, I needed to needed to get a little bit more centralized into my sales base as well, and you know, being uh, being neck deep in big trout instead of uh, you know the few that I knew by name already. Right um, was a an advantage for sure right right so dude so how's the uh it's funny because we're supposed to be talking about flies which we will but how's the hard bait business going man how are rat sales these days you know rat sales are are, are fine they they are they are good and i'm working on a new one um, um a new version of it which is uh which is pretty exciting for me because uh i've, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years and uh there's some there's some cooler things that i'm, I'm excited to play with um in that world. Uh, right now I don't have my, my shop set up, so I'm pretty much making jigs and spinner baits, but I'll right, tell you, that's right. keep, keep me crazy busy right now. So that's good. Well, yeah, I imagine, uh, you could sell a lot more jigs and spinner baits, you know, over the course of a year than, than rat lures, but, Absolutely. um, they, they, yeah. <laughs> they can't, they can't possibly be as much fun to tinker with. No, they're not nearly as much fun, but, um, but yeah, there's, it's still fun because I'm still tying, you know. So that that part's uh, that part's really exciting for me that I I still get to work on the vice every day. Right, right, and, right, uh, right. Yeah. And and dude, are you also working on some traditional swim bait style? You came out with some swim bait styles, some some non rats, did you not? I did. Yeah, I've got a few wake baits and uh, and and a couple others that I'm working on as well. Um, I'm also going to start getting into soft plastics and uh doing oh some, really yeah yeah because that's a whole nother world and that's a that's exciting too there's that's just a whole nother you know i, I don't say a hobby because it's going to be really uh, financially uh beneficial but um right most of this stuff for me is kind of like it, it was a hobby first you know and uh so the passion and the love for it is it's just so much fun to be able to do it it really is well that's the crazy thing, man. For so many years, you were so associated with the fly fishing world. I mean, I met you through fly channels and stuff like that. But for all those years while you were working on flies at Umqua, you were going home at night and carving hard baits, right? Yeah, I was an awful lot. Yeah. So, I mean, while I was uh, playing with feathers most of the day and, you know, I would go home and uh, man, every submission that we that we had at that point, I, I had to learn how to tie myself so I could right. help the factory. So I was... I spent a lot of time at home just tying um, the the new patterns, you know, um, not only for samples for the factories, but, you know, I, I needed to know the pattern inside and out. Um, sure. So, and if I could make it easier for the factories to tie, I did. So I spent an awful lot of time doing that. And then when that was all wrapped up, yeah, it was uh, making sawdust. Nice, man. So, dude, you're going into soft plastics. Are you still a one-man band, though? Like, do you have employees yet? Or are you, like, taking all this on by your lonesome? No, it's just me, myself, and I, man. Um, it's a lot to manage, and um, I'm, I'm working on, uh, you know, I think once I have a shop set up and I, I'm able to um, plan a lot further ahead, I, uh, I'm i going to bring in some employees and get some, some things done um, outside of my outside of my hands because I'm just going to... Sure. I'm not going to be able to handle it all, which is a beautiful thing, man. That's a, that's exactly what I wanted, you know, to oh, not no. be able exactly. to handle it. <laughs> No, that's exa- that's exactly right. And you you told me because, um, you know, we wrote the piece about your 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 rat lures a while back, and and you had always told me that like you've always just been obsessed with artificials in general, like the way they move and your you, you know lifelike movement. I mean, tell me a little bit about that. Like you, you've always just had this like obsession with design, right? It, yeah, absolutely. And and more more than that, it was. Um, you know, the animation, like you said, you know, what you can do with them and, and how you can create something to, to kind of, so you've got this image in your head, you, you know, what this action is that you want to achieve and right. all the steps that go into that and making it possible 
Um, I mean, it's like a, it's, it's like sitting at a table with a pile full of puzzle pieces and putting the thing together. And when you're done, you look at it and you're like, yep, there was only one way to do it, you know? Sure. And that, that sense right there is, is awesome. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, with fishing, it's, it's that initial, it's the sensation from the rod tip to, to your brain, you know, the initial that is the, is the drug, so to speak, that keeps you going back. Sure. And then in creating sure. baits, it's like the entire thing and it's the end instead of the beginning. So it's kind of, right. it's kind of, it's, it's, it's unbalanced in that way, but it's, uh, it, it's really, it's, it keeps it more exciting to me, at least. Sure. Sure. So you had told me for 10 years, you were the official decider of fly fate at Umqua. Is that right? Yeah. For the majority of the time I was there, I had a, a, a big part in it at Umqua. There was a, a little committee, but typically the flies were sent to my attention. And so I was like more or less the first round of defense, first line of defense. So if we were getting, uh, you know, another orange woolly bugger and it just didn't need to get through the channels, it didn't go through the channels, you know? Right. Um, right. So, so you, yeah. you decided if it went to committee, basically. Yeah. It had to pass part, through exactly. you first. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. And there was a lot involved so, with that decision too. I mean, it wasn't just open the box and oh, is this pretty? Um, I mean, of course, that has something to do with everything, but there's a lot more to it, an awful lot more well, to it. Sure, dude. And that that's that's what I want to talk about with you. I mean, I want to get into the nitty gritty because I think it's fair to say that, you know, for a lot of tires. That's like, you know, the the big league, like that's the ultimate goal, is it not to see something that you came up with, you know, sold through a big channel like Umqua or, or, or Orvis. So, I mean, back in those days, I mean, straight out of the gate, because I, 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 I sort of know the answer, but I want you to tell it, like, how many submissions, say, in a year? I mean, dude, was your office Ooh. just like over, like just like piles of fly submissions everywhere? Like how how, how many patterns came to your attention within a year? Oh, hundreds, hundreds. Um, yeah, gosh, it was, my office was, yeah, was a huge pile in itself. Um, but that wasn't the only pile. Um, you know, from that pile that we would receive, it was, you know, everything was called. So, you know, anything that was going to be considered would go to a different area completely. So there was another right. whole pile, you know, so there were, there were multiple piles. Um, and anything that wasn't going to be considered was, was typically returned, you know, rather quickly with, uh, with some sort of, uh, note along with it, you know, um, right. right. And, and hopefully something beneficial to the tire rather than, uh, you know, you're not accepted to the University of Pennsylvania letter. You know what I mean? Right. It was like, <laughs> here's all the reasons, yeah. some of the stuff you could have done or you could do and resubmit kind of thing, you know? Um, right. Well, dude, that's that's really refreshing to hear because I know it's not the case with everybody. So, my God, I mean, just the amount of time alone that you or somebody else had to take to write the try again letter. I mean, that's pretty impressive considering the amount of entries you were getting. It was it was an awful lot. Yeah, it really was. And it was uh, it, it was it was absolutely worth it on every level. But it wasn't something I looked forward to sitting down and doing, sure. you know, Sure, man. Yeah, I know. It's like it's like being a cop. You want to make the arrest, but you don't want to do the paperwork. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You don't want to be that guy, but you have to. Yeah, do. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, there obviously with that many submissions, there had to be some form of high grading. So you you you, you did it long enough that you kind of knew if it was a, a maybe or a yes or a no right out of the gate. So you know, one of the things that I've always been interested in is. When you're getting that many flies, what are some instant no's? Like you open that box and like you look at it, like what were some of the things that were just an instant not going to work for you? Um, well, there was always something. Um, I'd always get a bad vibe or a bad feeling about a fly that showed up in an envelope because you knew that it didn't look any, it no longer looked like it did when it was put in there. Um, okay. You know okay. what I mean? So, and there's a lot to be said for that in itself. So if, if you spend an awful lot of time creating a new pattern and it answered all the problems for your drainage, okay, and you felt that it was worthy of everybody else seeing and possibly selling, and you took it out of your box and you stuck it into an envelope and put a stamp on it and sent it off. Right. What's right. the impression on that 
that's the desk who's opening gets, you know? Yeah. It's like, wow, but yeah. how important is this? Right. You know, right. How much yeah. You didn't even take the time to stick it in foam and box it up. So it wouldn't be all smashed to shit when it got there. Exactly. So those were typically like, Oh boy, here we go again. You know, kind of, right. kind of things. Um, if you open a box and there's like a, and the, the flies are presented well, but you're looking at like, it looks like somebody went to the local fly shop and bought one of everything and tried to put right. it all on one hook. And you're like, Oh my, Oh my, no overload, <laughs> overload. It ain't going to happen. It's like $50,000 just in materials, just to tie one, you know, cause you gotta right. buy one of everything. So right. like the, the right. material investment, um, for me, I, that's one of the things I looked at right away was what's it going to cost to tie this fly? Um, sure. And, you know, and, and, and I, 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 I kind of thought we'd get to that down the road, but I mean, okay. you brought it up now. So it's like, I, you know, I, you see how trendy, you know, pike and musky fly fishing are right now. So I'm seeing companies, you know, more and more pumping out pike and musky flies yet in my opinion, None of them will ever be as good as the stuff that it's taken, you know, the Minnesota or Wisconsin boys three sessions at the vice to tie and they're full and there's, you know, three bucktails in one fly. But to your point, the reason you don't see that commercially, right, is because it's just it's too it, it end up being a fifty dollar fly. I mean, you, you yeah. have to weigh in ease of tying for the commercial tires overseas. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's a really important part of getting in is how easy something is to tie, right? Exactly. I mean, what's it going to cost in, in the long run? Yeah, they, the, the tires need to understand that this isn't, there aren't fly companies out there that are just waiting to promote new tires. That's not the case. It's not at all right. the case. They, it's a business. They need to make money. You know, so this, this new thing that comes across the desk needs to make money for the company. So right. it needs to have, it needs to be tried and true and tested. I mean, the best submissions we, that, that I, I ever saw, um, not, and this is a fairly bold statement and it wasn't, you know, it's not 100% accurate, but 90, 98 plus, some of the best submissions that we got that we knew were going to be sellers came through phone calls from shops that said, man, I've been really? buying this guy's fly. He can't tie him fast enough for me. What, what do we need to do to get you to do it for us? Now, okay, do you know how many bells and whistles go off in a fly company when that phone call happens? That's sure. guaranteed sales. That's guaranteed sales. There's sure. no question. You know, it's done. It's complete. There's no, you know, tinkering needed to be done with it. The guy's done it for a reason. It's already filled a fly bin. So it's already gained real estate in a fly shop. A fly shop owner has to be willing to take, to remove something from a bin to put your new pattern in. So it's got to be, it's got to be worth making money, you know, because you're taking a moneymaker out of play to put a question mark in. Right. Sure. You know, so uh, even from that standpoint, one of the best things a tire can do, and I know I'm getting ahead of, you, of both of us here, but I'm going to make this no, point go, real go. quick. Um, one of the best things a fly tire can do if he thinks he's got it nailed, if he thinks that this pattern is the shit. He needs to take it to the closest fly shop to him and see what the owners think. And if the owners look at him and say, well, you know, then it, it isn't. It isn't yet. Right. He needs to take it to right. another shop, you know. And if he gets the same response, then he solved the problem for himself, but he hasn't solved the problem, you know. Um, so it, it isn't worth putting in a, in a fly company's catalog if your local drainage isn't willing to carry it because it's got to work yeah. there first. Sure. And that's interesting, man. I never really thought about that. And and sadly, I think part of the reason I haven't thought about that is because I no longer live in an area that has fly shops. There were a few here, you know, they're they're all gone now. But um it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. If if a local tie is getting bought out, you know, and I imagine the higher traffic the area, you know, yeah, I, I imagine you have to weigh in how sort of, you know, niche that is before you guys make the call. Sure. Absolutely. Oh man. And there's a lot to it too, because that's just, I mean, that doesn't even get to guide flies, you know what I mean? And guide flies right, are a right, whole right. nother category that, you know, those are almost no brainers too, but then it really becomes a lot more specific to the materials. 
um, sure, isn't that sure. Isn't high for the you know because a lot when it gets into those high traffic areas, those guides are making money off of it. So now you've got a shop making money off of it, a company making money off of it, and a guide making off of money off of it. So there's a right. lot of responsibility right. this little hook has, you know. Um, so yeah, there's the fly companies have to look at things like that, and most fly tires shouldn't look at things like that on a daily basis because they have no reason to. But they need to at least be conscious of, of of what's going through the company's head when they're looking at the fly. But if you just want a, a pat on the shoulder and be like, man, you're a hell of a tire, but um, you tied a beautiful Prince nymph, but unfortunately it's a right, Prince nymph. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, <laughs> well, to, to that end, I mean, how, how much of those hundreds of flies that you saw every year, you, you just knew right away, like, you know, yeah, this is just a slight variation on something else or sort of a, you know, what was kind of the ratio between, hey, I tied this bugger different to, you know, here's a, a, a fly I created. I mean, did people submit just, you know, adding a different tail to something and try and get that through? Yeah, unfortunately, it's, it really is. It's, it's, it's gotten to that. And I definitely saw... Uh, that take place a lot more often um, towards the end of you know my career there, um, right. it, and, I, and I, I just equate it to the internet, honestly. Um, and that's not to say it's a bad thing, but I think it's you know all of a sudden somebody ties a fly and gets you know a bunch of hits on a web page, and they think that they've made it, and it's like, well, you know. You've made some. You've made some friends, buddy. But that doesn't mean right, anything. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah. you know, the majority of what I, uh, of what came across the desk was was you know it was just that other woolly buggers, other copper johns, other prince nymphs. How how much research time did you have to put in? Like, if something you know caught your eye to uh, you know to make sure it wasn't a knockoff, I would imagine that's something that that you checked uh you know fairly religiously and uh fluently yeah yeah without a doubt um yeah that was that and again that was something that took up an awful lot more of my time later in the years than than in the, the beginning um right. because there was just so much more of it but yeah an awful well, yeah, lot you and know, like you're was, saying with instagram like everybody throws a fly up on instagram now and it gets two thousand likes and that dude probably figures this needs to be an uncle pattern Right. That's just it. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And that's just not the case. You know, um, the reality is, is it's gotta, it's gotta solve a problem. You know, the, the pattern, sure. it, it's, it's a new pattern. It's a, it's a brand new thing. Um, it's gotta be created for a reason. You know, something else had to have failed for, for the mindset to start to recreate it. You know what I mean? And, right. and that's what I would ask the tires. What was the evolution of this? And if it was a, right. uh, uh, bum, well, you know, I had this yellow dubbing and I figured I'd make a yellow <laughs> salad, you know, then it was like, all right, you know, we're not willing to pay you money for that, you know, from right. this point forward, right. <laughs> you know, right. but if it, you know, if there was like, if you sat back in the chair and you, you were told a hell of a story, I mean, and then you believed every bit of it and it sounded good and realistic, you know, you continued the, that, that conversation. And it was worth sure. digging into, you know, um, and it, and those patterns were typically, I don't want to say ridiculous looking because they weren't ridiculous, but they were very non-traditional patterns. And that's exactly right. the trend that had to take place because, you know, you, how many pheasant tails are there? You know, too many. So right. what, what sure. new, sure. you know, um, so that was, that was what's the, that was the Christmas morning part of opening fly boxes, you know, that came across the desk every day was like, sure. is it, is it going to be the next copper John? Is it going to be the next game changer? You just don't know. You know what I mean? Um, that was fun. That was pretty fun. Sure. So if, if you saw something that you liked, kind of walk us through the next step. So, that, you know, this pattern made the, the maybe pile for one reason or another. I mean, you guys tested pretty hardcore over there. It was not all eyeballing. You had a whole test facility, did you not? We did. We had a, um, and I mean, I say a whole test facility there, and it may have changed since I've been there, but there was a, a very large tank, you know, so we could swim things and, you know, tank test things. Um, but we, we definitely did more than that too, if, especially if it was, uh, if it was a pattern that needed it, you know, you needed to understand what they were trying to relay. 
Um, and I don't have right. a good example off the top of my head, but you know, a lot of things were, you know, tied and tied on and taken out and fished. Um, and or sure. if it, if the seasonality didn't allow for it, you, you just got on the phone, man. And you just tried to find out as much as you could from the people that knew them because it's amazing. It's amazing what you learn, you know, when you start talking to the shop owners and the people that they know and, you Absolutely. know, this shiny, this shiny golden ring is, you know, it really ain't much more than a turd in everyone else's eyes, <laughs> you know? So right away, you're just like, wow, I just got fed an awesome story, man. That, that dude should be an author, not a fly tire. Um, right. But Right. Well, and, and I imagine this is the reason why, you know, and it's the same thing in, in, in writing. I mean, I hear it all the time working for Field and Stream. It's like you have these new guys that come out of left field. And they always they always wonder, you know, why why is it the same names often, you know, repeat writers in the magazine, and you know it's you have to explain that you know these guys get it. I mean, they they meet the criteria, they they know what you're looking for, they know how to how to get it done, which is how famous fly tires are made. You know, you do see a lot of the same names, you know, coming out with new patterns for that very reason. But just out of curiosity. Like how often, you know, or how many times, say, within a given year, um, would a completely left field guy, you know, not somebody you'd worked with before, you know, end up making it to the big leagues? Oh, uh, probably, probably a handful a year. I'd say close to a okay. handful a year. There was some uh, some brand new names, you know, um, and and, mo- and and quite frankly, most of them weren't young kids necessarily, but they right. were. Uh, they were just humble, you know, sure. and it took, sure. it took someone being like, dude, you should do this to, or someone doing it for them in some cases, you know, that, that, it, yeah, some of the, man, we got, I got some really awesome patterns that, you know, got into play, but the dude was a little bit nervous and just didn't want to hear no. So he never att- attempted Right, you know. Right. Well, dude, I have I have one in Orvis, and that was not a goal of mine by any stretch. Somebody else, my a guide buddy of mine, Joe Dimaldaris, he was like, "You should submit this," and I'm like, "Really? Okay, I get, I guess so." Like, I would have never have done that of my own accord. So, you know, I I get that. that there's probably some, been some really good flies out there that just needed a nudge from somebody else, you know, to yeah. give them the confidence to you know to put it in. Um, you know, I'm I'm curious, like uh, in your last couple years there, and this has probably you know changed more and more. But getting back to what you were saying about materials and how much will this cost to tie, you know, even in the trout game, you know, five years ago, if you wanted really good, you know, articulated trout streamers, for the most part, you had to go right to the tires, right to the guys who were tying them and selling them. And I feel like those patterns are are infiltrating the commercial catalogs more and more so i mean do you see sort of a like a a relaxation of that cost now is it getting to a point where the the companies are are saying man like people are really buying this shit so like we can't we have to kind of we have to kind of break away from the norm and be willing to get a little bit more involved here because that's what people want yeah um for sure there's i mean one of the biggest factors is there i mean there are synthetic materials being created all the time. There aren't animal right. materials being created all the time. Um, right. Mat- animal materials have red tape attached to them going as soon as they get boxed up, they've got red tape attached to them. And if it's going to a different country, there's even more, you know, and then there's fish and wildlife and there's expenses after expenses after expenses when there's animal products. Um, Dude, oh, this is fascinating because I, 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 I did not know this. So t- t- Expand on that. What do you What do you mean? Like, um, there's like legalities tied up in shipping bunny strips back and forth across uh, borders, kind of deal. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. You know, and some things are just flat out illegal to ship, and um, so it, it may not be illegal to ship from the United States to you know location A, but if it's going to location B, that country says no, we don't want it here. It can't come here. Well, really? you know. Oh, yeah. You know, and the same thing. It's like, you know, this material has always been available and always been, you know, indigenous to this place, but it can't leave there. So they can't legally ship it out of there. And it's like, well, well, um, we kind of need it to, you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be yeah. really great if it could. What do you mean? 
So is, it, yeah, is there one? Is there an example that stands out? Like, is there is there some material off the top of your head that you know was like a real pain in the ass in, in that jungle regard? cock? Jungle cock is always oh, been yeah. one of those okay. things. You know, it's just okay. uh, there's a a really good example. Um, jungle cock is a, is, a, is a really you know traditional material. Um, it's beautiful on damn near everything from little jacid, you know, dry flies to sure. you know uber crazy beautiful salmon flies, but um, can't ship it from a lot of places. <laughs> so um, so can't, we can't get can't that here it. is the problem, right? Like overseas, they can get it. It's here that we can't have it, right? Right, right. So it's an import. It's an import thing rather than an export thing. Um, gotcha. So basically, if you're tying up some awesome shit with jungle cock and sending it to uh, an Orvis or an Unqua, just like forget that. Like that's an instant much. out. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, and that's an unfortunate thing because I mean that a lot of patterns. I mean, it, it's really hard to replace jungle cock without a little photocopied piece of plastic that they sell. You know yeah, what I mean? And then you're I've like, seen those. Yeah. awesome! I I just strapped. I just spent forty hours tying a salmon fly, and I just strapped a piece of plastic to the head. Right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like the worst possible I've seen him. scenario. I've seen him. Oh. Well, I hear you though with this with this synthetics. I, maybe that's the thing that the companies can't get away from because, like, one thing I I found kind of interesting over the last few years. You know, I, I'm not you know calling these guys out or anything, but uh, you know, Flyman Fishing Company they come out with some pretty innovative stuff: the sculpt yeah. helmets, the bait fish helmets. People were really into that stuff, but when I saw it, I thought, well, you know, in a lot of cases. It's their innovation that is making a cool new pattern. It's because of what they came up with that now Tire X is doing something a little different. But I thought that's never going to infiltrate commercial tying because it's it's just kind of all about, in a lot of cases, the use of that one material. Yet every year at IFTD and at ICAST, when I see the new catalogs come out, I can I couldn't believe the the amount of flies that are now in catalog that feature those products, which tells me they're, they're just, they, they can't be overlooked anymore. No, you're right. They can't be, you know, and a lot of it had to do with cost initially, you know, when it, when a lot of those things were brand new and I was still in the game, um, you know, Slyman or whoever the company may be that introduced this new material, um, they, they, of course, and, and rightfully so, they weren't willing to, you know, to drop the pants on price for right. you, you know, sure. and, and I get that. That was their brand new material. They needed to make hay with it. Um, you know, and, and a couple of years later, those things started to become a little, they, they would start to get knocked off, quite frankly. And right. the scope and helmet wouldn't be necessarily bought from, you know, the real designer, but they'd be bought from, you know, whoever has knocked it off at a fraction sure. of the cost. And now sure. it's capable of finding its way into a catalog because that, Otherwise, two dollar fly is three fifty. Right. All because of the head, right. flat sure. out. Period. Sure. You know, so that's a that's a pretty that's an that's a steep that's a steep pill to swallow. You know, for everybody and, and shop owners especially, it's like, man, how much do I have to invest to put this thing in the building? Oh my god! Right. I can't. Exactly. I mean, it's like it comes down to like not buying caddis or buying this crazy new sculpin hell. Or head thing. It's like well, I need caddis. Right. Uh, I've never needed right. this open head thing. You know. <laughs> right. So right. well. So I, in in your time at at, uh, at Umqua, like, um, would you say within a given year, you know, was there a standout category of fly that you saw submitted more than others? Uh, tungsten nymphs. Tungsten nymphs. Really. Were- I- yeah. Man, I would have thought streamers would have been the answer to that question. You were bombarded by tungsten nymphs, huh? Yeah, no. We, I, I, when I was there, I wanted more streamers. Streamers, streamers. I, I couldn't get enough streamer submissions, and unfortunately, the ones we were getting were just not, um, not. I, I, they were just too damn expensive. They were just too right. damn expensive. Right. Um, right. So. Yeah. Um, and a lot of time like that innovation thing just kind of gets clouded with, you know, well, if I just keep adding shit to it, no one's done that yet. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> As it's funny. And like, we're going like, to we're going to trail off. But like, you know, I, I and this is going to piss some streamer guys off and I apologize. But I sort of feel that way. Like, you know, I tie a ton of streamers and I I don't think I would ever I don't think I would ever try and submit one because. 
frankly, it's just like you know what materials wiggle nice, and a lot of times it's a reaction bite. So to come along and say, well, you know, this one is that much better. I mean, not to say there aren't innovative streamers out there because there certainly are, but I think a lot of times streamer tying just becomes, like you said, just – adding more shit because you didn't put yeah. it in there last time. So it's like, well, I've tied this a thousand times. It catches fish. But today I'm going to put some rubber legs in it. You know what I mean? So, right. Or I'm going to give it a mohawk when I trip. Right. So what the hell? Is it, yeah. But is it really a better fly or a more innovative fly or did you just add more shit to it? So course, I hear what yeah. you're saying. You, you probably got a lot of these submissions that look great and they're just so bulked up with stuff. It just financially made no sense for you. And, and, well, that's that's part of it, and it was just like tying it, and it's like, well, man, it just doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason to why these materials are stacked in here the way they are. Because when you look right. at it move and you look at it, it's like it it hasn't accomplished any, you know, um, image, you know, baitfish profile, and it stands out as, oh, I get it, those lines are there because it's supposed to be a smallmouth. You know, right. No, <laughs> yeah. that's not why that material is there. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> had it been, it yeah. would have been like. Dude, this is the way to do this from now on. But right, right. Never, right. never came across that. Unfortunately, it was that's, more. Just- that's it's it's funny though that you say you you didn't get. I figured towards the end, like knowing knowing what years you were there, like that was right around when you know the the articulated trout streamer thing was really like ramping up, and I figured you would have just been inundated with with doubles, you know. Oh gosh, yeah. The year after the game changer, the, the years after. The, actually, you know what? Um, it was interesting. Directly after the game changer was introduced, there wasn't too many. I, I mean, I, I kind of. It was interesting because I really kind of felt like no one was quite ready to step on Blaine's toes yet. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, with sure. the game, no one was quite willing to do it yet. So you didn't see it right away. But then, like. It, but then all of a sudden, it was kind of like the, the floodgates opened and, and everything. I mean, crayfish, you name it. Yeah. Stoneflies, everything was articulated. And right. mostly poorly. Right. You know, yeah. it wasn't. No one under, No one took the time to figure out that you couldn't just put a mono loop and attach another segment and it was going to work right. You know what I mean? Right. There or was, that it was better. Because or that I, it was better I, for that matter. Yeah. I, I got totally ate up in the early days with the articulated streamer deal. And I, I mean, I was like, oh, this is just the coolest shit ever. And I and everything I had had to be articulated. And now, right. to be quite honest, I, I feel like I throw less articulated stuff than I ever have before. It's become very, you know, sort of situational. Is it the right river, right time, and right place no, to go big and, you know, throw an articulated pattern? But, I mean, that was the trend. That still is the trend. Which is why I would imagine you were glutted with tungsten nymphs, because that would have been right around when euro and Czech nymphing were were getting really popular. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know it was a kind of a trend where also where tungsten wasn't quite as steeply as expensive, um, and wasn't quite as separated in fly shops any longer. Right. Um, so the price tag wasn't quite as, you know, different. Um, and, and that's not true in every shop by any means, but, um, those costs started to blend a little bit over time. And, uh, the reality is, is it was kind of phasing out brass, you know, or, or right. Right. And lead because it just, it got, it got, the fly got where it needed to be right away. You know what I mean? It was right. more effective with tungsten. So, um, once I, I just think that that was a trend that needed to finally set its place, and it did. Um, and well, then the okay, jig, I, nymphs, I, yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah, on the jig hooks, yeah, sure. And and I don't I don't tie many nymphs. I don't nymph fish very much, frankly. But I mean, okay, the tungsten part of it has nothing to do with the tire. That's just technology upgrade or more cost effective. But then you look at a lot of those jig style nymphs and tungsten nymphs and check nymphs. I mean, there ain't a whole hell of a lot of stuff on that hook. So, right. I mean, considering how minimalistic a lot of them were, like, what's an example of, of something, you know, one of those that caught your eye? I mean, you know, that was that was different enough to make it. Because, I mean, you're only going to put so much on there. So, like, you know, what's one of those that, you know, hooked you, pardon the pun, and why? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, there was a few, actually. Um, Lance Egan's uh, Frenchie. Was one okay. um, because it was very recognizable. A so okay. here's a new trend in in flies, you know, that's coming out super thin, you know, minute bodies, no legs, you know, just bare bones. 
um, it needed to be recognizable to, to trout fishermen, you know, who were just going in and willing to try out something that wasn't the typical pheasant tail, but they still needed to feel confident in it. Um, that one, I think that, I think that fly paved the way for sales of, of, uh, that style fly. Um, okay. Steve Parrott came right after with his, uh, with his series of, of, uh, jigged nymphs that are, you know, epoxied bodies. So it's a very, very slender body with a, a wrap of flash and, um, the typical kind of picked out thorax. So it was recognizable, very, it had its bugginess, but it also had the Euro sleekness. Um, mm -hmm. very a beautiful, beautifully tied fly too. So, I mean, you could, you could, it, I mean, confidence built in almost because it was just, it, it was what it needed to be. Um, right. so his flies as well, they definitely, they're, that was a gr those are two great examples of like the kind of the beginning of that and opening the doors for it. Um, and also, you know, really in fly shops too, because it's, it's hard. It, I understand that $2 is a lot for people to swallow or $3 is a lot per fly. Um, sure. it's not, it isn't get over it. Right. it that's cheap right. as can be, <laughs> you know what I mean? But then when you look at something that is literally like hardly anything and they still want more for it, you're like, okay, you know, I get that yeah. mindset. It's frustrating. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that goes so, into a fly for two bucks, man. <laughs> sure. Sure. No, no, no. And that's what people don't get. I mean, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, um, what, which, which sort of fly category, was the hardest to break into like with like where there was sort of the, the maybe the least amount of room for innovation you know i mean did you have a lot of guys trying to invent new standards in dry fly where i mean where which category was hardest to to win you over with well the hardest one the hardest category period was saltwater um and really there was some okay. and it wasn't for submissions i mean beautiful beautiful submissions the problem was placement the thing with okay. saltwater is every beach on every coast of the same damn ocean requires a different hook. So a different hook. Yeah. Okay. So you've got people on one side of Florida who absolutely hate the 200 S or the, um, sorry, the TM goes 600 SP won't go near it. Absolutely hate it. The other side, that's the only hook they'll touch. The only one that they'll use. You can't sell to a market like that. The same fly on how many different hooks. You know what Interesting, I mean? Interesting, dude. I mean, I yeah. do a ton of saltwater fly fishing, and all I do is look at the hook and go, is that going to break or bend? Okay, no, it's fine. It's but, fine. I mean, I'm not tarpon fishing or anything. I mean, I, I don't I don't live in Florida, so it's it's stripers and bluefish and false albacore. But I had no – that's the first – this is great because that's the first I've ever heard of that. I had no idea that salty guys were such hook snobs. They are. They really are. Uh, and not and, – and not – it's a good thing. It's a good thing that they are. And the reason is, is they're, I mean, they're, most of those guys are trying to make a living doing it. You know what I mean? And they just can't afford right. to have hooks breaking on them left and right. So th that's the sure. reality is that they just stay away from hooks that they know aren't going to bring money at the end of the day. Um, but that is such a diverse group of anglers. And I mean, as damn near anybody who's gone down and gotten a saltwater guided trip, you can bring all the shit you want. It isn't going to get tied on. You know, what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Dude. and and so, you know that is so funny because that that goes well beyond fly fishing. Like I was just in Louisiana, and we were we we were not fly fishing at all. We but we were trying to pop tuna, black fins, and yellow fins. And I do that at home, and I brought, I mean, a box of like my best, like most trusted fish catching tuna poppers. And the dude took one look at him. He was like. Uh, I don't like any of this, like none of it, like nothing in the entire box was up to snuff. And I had to like sneak my own poppers on oh my and God. most yep. of the time we were using his, but, but no, you are absolutely right. That is the truth. Um, that is a fishery where that dude knows best. And most of the time I found it's better to just roll with it. Cause he, he actually does, you know? Yeah. And you don't want to start the day with that conversation going wrong. You exactly. know what I mean? You're on the boat with the dude all day. You just listen, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I you know, it, salt water is funny because there's a whole lot of it, but I mean, it's still fairly, you know, niche market. I mean, did you, did you see a lot of salt water patterns submitted every year? Tons, tons, tons. I mean, really? we, uh, 
Oh, the the tarpon's hood has been reinvented so many times; it's unreal. Um, the clouser has been reinvented uh, unbelievable number of times. Sure, um, sure. You know, it's on. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So so much. Um, it's it's a fun. They're a fun. It's a fun category of flies to tie. You know, it really is. Right. Um, right. Right. And yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of playing to do with those. Um, but it's also a very, very specific fishery per the guide. Um, a B chain versus lead. I mean, right. on a gotcha, it, it depends well, sure. where the wind's blowing and everything else under the sun. So, <laughs> well, now, now you're getting into flats, and and I yeah. know that. I mean, I, I've met guides, you know, who permit and bonefish, and he's like. Uh, is there epoxy on the head of your fly? I'm like, yeah. He's like, nope, no good. Like, it, like, dude, they tie their flies with rubber gloves on. And, you know, I know. And, like, no, no epoxy, no glue, nothing. You nothing. know, so I and you can agree or disagree that that matters while you're there. But if he's your guy for the day, you you like, you're right. You don't start it off wrong and and say no thanks to that. You know, but yeah, exactly. That's the right. last I mean, bit of advice you're going to get if you say no to them. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, yes, and you're right. Once you start getting into flats and stuff like that, which, uh, you know, I know not a ton of people listening to this do, but that is the truth, man. I think there's no saltwater fishery where guides get more nuts, permit especially. And I've never targeted permit on the fly, but like I've never seen dudes get more nuts about what they're throwing than guys throwing it at a permit on the flats. So yeah, no uh, doubt. It's just interesting that you say all that because I I never I I always think of saltwater as sort of easier. But then again, I'm I'm fishing for really dumb fish. I mean, you know, you know what I mean. Like, if, dude, if you got blitzing, sure. if there's stripers like churning the water to froth in front of you. Uh, it really doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of difference in no, which deceiver I choose. You know what I mean? Nope. And that's just more of the saltwater fly fishing that I'm used to. You know, albacore, same thing. Is it the right size? Are they up? They're probably going to eat it. As long um, as it's in the water. You know, that's the biggest as long thing. As it's... You just put it in the water, <laughs> then you're going to get caught. Yeah, yeah you're going to get bit. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm curious, man, like um, in 10 years of being uh, the fly guy there, what are a couple of the sort of the patterns that, that you discovered or, you know, brought to market that you were most proud of? Maybe that are, you know, still carrying on now strongly, you know, because of you directly. Uh, let's see. I was I was really, really excited when Matt Bennett's lunch money came across my desk. That Aha. was that was okay. a really good day. That's a really good week, actually, because not only because <laughs> of the way that it was presented, I mean, the dude made this shadow box that was just worthy of never cracking and just hanging on the wall. <laughs> and he had like six of each color of his pattern of the lunch money colors in there. And it was, it was gorgeous. I mean, I, I did. I took a picture off the wall and I hung it because it was something I could right. sit back and look at and just enjoy right. that, this dude's <laughs> creation, you know? Um, so working with him to get that thing to market was that I, that's a big one. That's I'll never well, forget I, the lunch money. I love that fly. It has absolutely become a go-to for me in a lot of situations, and it has saved my bacon in situations. But assuming there's some people listening to this that don't know what the lunch money is, I'll let Brian explain the fly, the fly. Because if you have one in your box, uh, it's probably because of Brian. So tell tell the good people what it is. It's a genius fly. Yeah, it's just, it really is. It's just a – I mean, it's a beautiful, compact – Easy to cast, easy to manipulate. So I mean, by that I mean like you can you can fish it in really shallow water in in riffles and do it like traditional style mending to to hit seams. Um, right. It, it moves very well uh, because it's tall enough to give it a profile. And it's also right. tall enough to give it the profile of the shad, the bluegill, of the bait fish he intended it right. for. Yeah. Um, so the crossover fly, absolutely. Um, good, strong hook. It's got rabbit out the back. Uh, it's that dude knows how to blend yeah. laser dub. Yeah. He knows. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, and in, it in is, essence, like it's just said, a dime size shad. Like it's a, it's a teeny tiny little thing, but yeah. like you said, I've, I've caught fish like damn near indicator fish in it and then like stripping it like crazy. 
I mean, yep. it is, you know, it is a versatile little fly. Very versatile. Yeah, that's it. You know, and you get something like those were the kinds of those were like the Christmas morning that you you got the Red Rider BB gun. You know what I mean? You <laughs> opened it up that box and you were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can't wait to march this thing around the building and show everybody who works here how cool yeah. this pattern is, you know? Yeah. And so those were, and that's literally what I would do too. Cause it was like, anybody who cares is going to go see, it's going to see this right now because they're right, going to right, right, right. You know? Right. Um, so that, that for sure was a big one. Um, they're, uh, the game changer, of course. Um, and I got to work with Blaine an awful lot and, and right. that was just, that's an incredible experience in itself. Right. Um, so, so that's I'm Blaine chocolate so pattern. Yeah, sure. Then that's Blaine Chocolate's pattern, uh, the game changer, and I think a lot of people know what that is. Okay, I mean multiple jointed bait fish, and I'm curious about that one because to me it would seem like if I saw that, obviously you'd see the innovation, you'd go, "Holy shit!" Like this is crazy. But I mean, that one had to. Did that one give you any pause getting tied, you know, in, in a factory somewhere? Because I like, I know how to tie a game changer, and this is probably just because I suck. But, like, maybe one out of three will swim the way I want it to. So, I mean, quality control with that, you know, that did that worry you at all? I mean, it's a pretty – it's simple, but it has to be done right or else she ain't going to sluggo on you. Yeah, that that was a nightmare. That was, a, that okay. was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> um, that, thing, that thing couldn't have – that thing couldn't have been created at a worse time. Um, four <laughs> months prior to that – would have been outstanding. Um, but it really came at crunch time and, uh, there was an awful lot to get done, get that thing done, um, right. in time. And, uh, but it was worthy of it because right. it was sure. sure. So it was so, it was everything that anything else wanted to be. Um, it's appropriately sure named, dude. Goes. I mean, the name is spot on. It was an absolute game changer. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yes, that one and that thing, Quite frankly, the color scheme, the, the rainbow, the rainbow trout color was rejected more often than not because they just came in looking so horrible. Really? Um, they, oh, man. They just. So you're yeah. saying from the factory, like you, you'd get them in to inspect them and, and you just didn't like what you were seeing. Yeah, they were so ugly. So, so <laughs> ugly. But that was a learning curve. You know, there's, and that was why I said it couldn't have come at a worse time because every pattern has a long learning curve to get it done right. You know, and it's right, a process sure. where the tires are involved, the factories involved, the companies involved, and the patterns are being sent back and forth until the approvals is, you know, is done. Um, until the tire says, yeah, this is, this is what, this is what I would put my name on, you know? Right. Um, so we had to, we had to really fast track an awful lot of that with, with that pattern, um, unfortunately, but it was, uh, it, you know, it ironed itself out. It, it did, but it was, uh, that was for sure. I mean, a nightmare. It was the best thing that could, could have come across the table. And, you know, two days later it was like, Oh my God, I wish this thing would disappear. <laughs> yes. But for, for the record, mm -hmm. but for the record, is it not fair to say that in, in, in no small way, you are the guy that that put the game changer in front of every fly fisherman out there. I mean, like you launched that puppy. So anybody who's that ever was, picked one up, yeah, that was one that I fought for. I I fought for that one for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I unfortunately I, I I suffered for it too. Where um, Blaine didn't have enough time to get the samples done, you know, because it was right. that close. So yeah. I was that dude, and. I got to go home and figure out how to get that, get 20, 24 of those things done by tomorrow. Damn, you know, dude. That, that sounds awful. <laughs> Having tied them. Yeah. If you've ever tied one, <laughs> then you know just how awful that is. 24 yeah. white and 24 rainbow. Oh, the nightmare. That's why I said two days later, I was like, this thing needs to disappear, you know, <laughs> because all of a sudden it was my burden. <laughs> But, oh, uh, but no, I couldn't have been more proud of it. I mean, and just the whole experience working with Blaine, because I know what he went, that I knew about that thing long before, you know, it was done. Um, working with Blaine to get that concept rolling. Um, he kept me in the loop with what he, he was doing. Um, and it was, that was an awesome experience.
It really was. Yeah. And then to finally sure. see it, I was just like, dude, it was everything you said it was. It really right. is everything you said it is. Right. And right. holy bullshit. My God. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, you know, when you, when you look at something like the Game Changer that's, that was just so next level, um, you know, truth be told, is it, is it harder for people to break into this now than it was, say, 10 years ago because of, you know, what you need to one up and, you know, sort of be on top of all these synthetics and things? Well, you know, more. Yes, it's definitely harder. And the reality is, is the guys who should keep winning are the guys who are willing to become the next Blaine Chocolate, the next Mike sure. Mercer, the next Charlie sure. Craven, Kaufman. And what I mean by that is those guys didn't just sit down and start tying flies and everything that they tied was great. They did it for, they did everything they did was for a reason. It was because of the time they spent on the water. It was because the entomology that they understood and what they were seeing and just being present, you know, out there is enough to, to, to know why and what needs to be done to make that next step. If you go searching for the next step, you're going to trip over it every time. But right. if you put in, you know, if you put in your chips and you sit down on the water long enough, stuff is going to start to appear to you. It's going to start making sense and you're going to be able to do something with it. That's Mike Mercer. That's Charlie Craven. That's Blaine Chocolate. Jack Dennis, you, you, the, the list goes on, but look at the age group I'm talking about. Right, right. Yeah. That should be the focus of the tires. It's the, you know, you got to chase materials. You have to chase materials. You don't have to use them. You don't. You don't have to use it just because it's new. That, that, that isn't necessarily solving the problem. You know what I mean? The problem should come from a problem on the water, not a device. Right. You know, that's, that, so, to alleviate that struggle of the next generation of tires, you know, if I could, if I could speak out to them, I would say, do it. Study Mike Mercer, study those names, go to a fly shop, find a catalog, look at the catalog, look at what's available. Don't do those things <laughs> because they're already done. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and most most catalogs are available online now. For I mean, as far as I know, so I mean, you can see those things, and you can see you can track uh, Mike Mercer's patterns. Look at everything he does. Read the books that he's written about why he did it. There you go. Do that. Start there. <laughs> can, can you become then you understand a, can you the be, game you're playing? <laughs> so so can you become like a, a millionaire doing this, man? No, 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 no. You're going to do all of this work. You're going to go through all of this, you know, emotional struggle. And if, if it gets picked up, you're going to make dozens of dollars, dude. Dozens. <laughs> Hey, quick caveat for any of the hardcore old school punk fans listening to this. Did you happen to recognize the lead in and out music for Brian? Okay. I often ask my guests, is there a particular band that you want me to lead you in and out with? And his response was, well, I'm really into bluegrass or seven seconds. So that was seven seconds. And that is some old school shit right there. And it is not often these days that you hear somebody Ask to be led in and out with seven seconds. So extra props to Brian for that. Now, for all of you fly-tying hopefuls out there that dream of seeing your name in the uh, ultimately dim lights that come with uh, being a major league fly designer, okay, you will never get better insight from a better dude on the behind-the-scenes of how it happens than you just got from Schmitty, Okay. I bet you there's a bunch of you thinking right now about some bug, all right, that's either sitting on your bench or maybe it's already half cocked in the vise, you already put some legs on it, that you were just sure, okay, was going to be your money maker, and now he's got you thinking and he's got you asking questions about it, and that is exactly why I wanted to talk to Brian, because when it comes down to brass tacks, okay, a fly catching a whole bunch of fish is only one little microscopic part of what makes that fit to go in the Umqua catalog. 
And I, I really think that the most important thing that, that he said in terms of advice would be making sure that your fly, that your design solves some kind of problem. And not just a problem, okay, that you and your four fly fishing friends are having on Phil Collins Creek down the street, okay? Now, again, all right, I have to relate this back to the Master Splinter, even though I cannot stress enough that I am, I am not chest beating over that in any way. It was something that just kind of happened, right? But now, after, after listening to Brian, I've almost put a lot of pieces together for myself about that, okay? Did it solve a problem? Yes. It was a cheap mouse. There's not that many materials in it, okay? Nobody has to spin hair to make it. So it is very cost effective. Even though it started out as something that we were using to catch browns in one place, it's like, will it catch them everywhere? Yes. Will it catch a whole bunch of other things? Bass, stuff like that. Pike in other places? Yeah, it will. Did it have more people than just me pumping it up as this awesome fly? Yes, it did, because as, as Brian said, which was also tremendous advice, if you think you have a pattern that's got the juice, right, don't send it to him right away. Take it to the fly shop in town, if you have one, and ask them what they think about it. You know, come to think about it, again, it's like hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, that kind of happened with the Master Splinter. Within a, a, a week of, of us catching some fish up there and filming that episode, one of the local shops, Border Water Outfitters, that's, that's actually no longer there, um, you know, the owner had, had his, one of his kids, you know, the kid worked there, sitting there knocking out splinters and throwing them in the bin. So even though I didn't fully realize it at the time, it was really meeting all the criteria that, that Brian uh, talked about. And I, I would love to say that I was smart enough to envision all that and figure all that out. I wasn't, okay? That was that was sort of like, you know, dumb luck and good timing, which subsequently uh, accounts for a lot of really good things that happen to people. But now that you hear it from Brian, okay, you, you hear about what the guy who did that for 10 years is looking for, all right? If that's not a nudge towards getting there, if you've been on the fence about a pattern, you should be able to essentially edit yourself a little bit, right, based on what he had to say, okay? And speaking of editing... All right, I think that's an important thing to point out. I, I would venture to guess that, you know, sometimes it, it's it's one or two materials or, or just a few aspects of a fly that might stop it from making a guy like Brian's maybe pile. And, you know, in fact, you know, the original Master Splinter, uh, you know, there's video tutorials on doing this. I would get a piece of, of uh, Black Bunny strip and sit there and snip it carefully in half to make it thinner and then shave off all the hair except for a little puff at the end, and that would be the tail. And it's a good tail. It looks great in the water. But when I submitted it to Orvis, I did have you know, a pretty good understanding that ease of tying you know, sells a fly to these guys. If, it, if it's something that the people in China or India or Pakistan or wherever flies are made okay, have to spend 20 minutes a bug tying little less likely that one of the big players is going to pick up that pattern. So when I submitted it, I changed it to a chenille tail. I just put a chenille tail on it and burn the end. And it, it's it's funny the loyalty people have to flies and sort of, um, you know, how much they pay attention to stuff like that. Because as soon as the fly came out, I'm getting all these messages like, I thought the original Splinter had a rabbit strip tail. And I was like, this is wrong. It's wrong. It's, that's, that's not right. It has a rabbit strip tail. Yeah. It does, okay? But I think it's also a perfect example of people also have this tendency to get crazed over minutia with a fly. Because let me tell you what, I've made them with the original rabbit strip tail. I have fished them with a chenille tail. I have colored a rubber band black with a Sharpie and used that as a tail. Most recently, I have been buying this really thin black rubber like uh, craft necklace stuff at the craft store and making tails out of those. And I got to tell you, the fish eat every damn iteration of the Master Splinter equally, okay? When it comes to any reaction fly, 
be it a mouse at, at night or a streamer during the day, I, I firmly believe that as long as it's got, you know, the right action and it's the right size, if it gets in front of a fish that's ready to go, it's going to go. And a rabbit strip tail versus a chenille tail versus a rubber band tail in, in that nanosecond when a brown is going to make its move in the dark has absolutely no significance whatsoever. So think about that when you tie. If something is complicated, weigh in. Does this does this really, in the long run, make that much of a difference? And maybe in some cases, with some flies, it certainly would. But, you know, I, I, I think uh, a, a lot of times, you know, with streamers in particular, as Brian was saying, you know, people have a tendency to just keep adding more and more shit to a streamer when in reality, like, come on, man, rabbit strip tail, little bit of flash, laser dub head, it's going to get eight. Nine times out of ten, it's going to get eight. It might not be as fancy as, as what you wanted it to be, but nine times out of ten, I believe it's going to get eight. You know, and, and another thing that, that's worth bringing up is that, you know, I, I, I feel like I see a fair amount on social media. You know, you'll have you'll have fly designers that have commercial patterns out there getting all bent out of shape when somebody ties something really similar and calls it their own or, you know, they're 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 selling some some patterns that, that they tie that are, you know, a copy or, or similar and, you know, they get, all, they get all butthurt about it, man. Like, they get all fired up. Now that you understand that nobody should be in this for the money, okay? Like, you're not, you're not getting rich off having a fly in an Orbis or an Umquil catalog, okay? To me, what's more satisfying than selling a Master Splinter is seeing somebody else's version. Seeing somebody else put a video on YouTube of how they tie it, and, and maybe they tweak it just a little bit, or maybe they tie it right to spec, okay, and change the colors and send me a picture of one in a, in a brown trout's mouth. I mean, to me, you know, fly tying should be like file sharing. We're all in this together. You feed off each other. You, you learn from each other. You tweak based on what somebody else is doing. You come up with a good tweak yourself. That's the fun of it. So I, I've had people you know, send me links to articles on how to tie the master splinter. And I, 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 you know, maybe I get credit, maybe I don't. But if I don't, I'm not going to fly off the handle about it. I'm not going to, you know, reach out to the dude and ream him for it. To me, it's just rewarding that, you know, maybe you should have given me credit. But at, but at the same time, you, you thought the pattern was good enough to take the time to write something up or shoot a little video to teach other people how to do it. You know, the most rewarding part for me by far is when I get a picture of a splinter in a fish's mouth in Alaska or Nova Scotia or Labrador or a bass in Louisiana. I've had pictures of splinters in fish's mouths over in Europe, okay? And most of the time, they are not bought flies. The, the people who are fishing them tied them or, or somebody else tied them for them. But like I don't, I don't care. Like, so what? That's it's. It, there's nothing more flattering than knowing that some stupid little thing that you came up with on your vice in a motel room in Hancock, New York, caught somebody a trout or a bass or a pike in Europe or Alaska. Like that is the bomb. So to any tires out there, that should be, you know, what drives you. You know, is is taking something that you've created and seeing it go far and wide. You know, I will never forget uh, a couple years ago, I walked into the fly show here in Jersey and I started out on uh, Tires Row. And the first table literally that I came to, there were about six dozen master splinters on a piece of driftwood on the table. And the guy is sitting there tying a master splinter and he's looking down at the vice, but he could kind of tell that somebody was looking at his table. And without looking up, he's like, those mice, man, they catch everything. They're great. They're, uh, you know, two for four dollars show special. They're awesome. And I was like, thanks, man. I'm glad you think so. And and he looked up and was like, oh, oh, I, oh uh, yeah, uh, these are, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope this is. And I was like, dude, chill. That's great. Like that. You just made my day. I'm not pissed off. 
You just made my day, man. Like you're, you, you, if you're making a couple bucks off of these and getting them out to more people to go catch fish in more places, that's awesome. I could care less. Anyway, fly tires. I have given you some ammo, okay, to shoot on your road to success. And for everybody out there who doesn't tie, who just fly fishes, I hope you guys got a little bit better appreciation for what goes into those patterns that are slaying it for you that you can luckily go grab at the fly shop whenever you want. It's because of guys like Brian that you can do that. Tie them up, catch them up, and I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. As always, thanks so much for listening to the Hook Shots podcast.